Hello and welcome to the Lost Heart Podcast. I'm Paul and I'm here with Gar. That's me. And today we are doing our 104th episode, I believe. 101. 101. And it is entitled Beat the Beatles. Yes. What bands had it in their heads that they were going to take the crown? Mm. Who, which record labels were telling them, you're going to be the next Beatles. Yep. Not, not so much the next Beatles. We could do a whole episode on that, like mm. Oasis and all them. That's different. Yep. And I don't really want to do that episode, to be honest with you, because yeah. that's all bullshit. This was bands that were at around the same time as the Beatles. Exactly. Uh, taking them on in the charts at the time. Mm. And which ones came close. Exactly. And which ones made the Beatles nervous. And which ones uh, had lasting legacies. Exactly. Some, cause some, didn't, some didn't really so much. But... Uh, this is an interesting enough one because um, it, 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 this episode has gone through a few sort of changes. Mm. We started on ones like "What songs sound like the Beatles?" And yeah. then we were like, "That that could be a different one." This then mm. it was like, "Which bands would have taken over from the Beatles?" And then we were like, oh, "I don't know." <laughs> so there's a bit of that in all of them. I think. Yeah. I think this, we, we, we'll come up with a, a, a proper sort of flow. You'll, you'll see soon enough. But we did pick uh, ten bands. Who I'm sure in my head at some stage in their career in the sixties went, We could fucking do this, lads. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We could so, we could beat them. That's it. In the immortal words of uh, Omar from The Wire, if if you come with the king, you best not miss. So <laughs> all of these all of these bands like had a proper swing. Had a proper swing at it, you know. Um if we're looking if we're looking at whether, the whether they did it inevitably or not. Yeah, exactly. Did. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these bands, some of these bands are still going to this day. Uh, yeah. So you can't, we can't, you, you, you'll hear how we, how we kind of have worked this out and it will make sense as, as we go on. But um, if, if we think of, it's the 1960s, who is top of the charts every single time they put something out, it's the Beatles. So that's yeah. the, they're in a mountain that has to be surpassed or at least matched before a band is considered to be kind of, one of the biggest groups in the world and but much like much like grunge this yeah. was part of a movement oh big time yeah. and we'll get into the um, the uh what the english invasion or the british invasion, the british invasion yeah which is That's a big really big what, factor what, in this big factor in this so yeah. this is like if if the beatles were nirvana who were the pearl jam who yeah. were alice and james who yeah. were sound gardens exactly. and were they different and did they really were they really trying? Maybe exactly. we'll never know if they were really trying, but definitely look at the charts. That's what we're going to talk about. Yeah, big time. Big time. So who is your fourth band that you think either maybe thought of taking on the Beatles or just by default were? Well, the, my first choice probably shouldn't have been my first choice. I probably should have went with a... I should have mixed this up a little bit, but we're going to go into the deep end here in my... In my uh, the, the way I've kind of approached this. I picked the Kinks, and mostly I picked yeah. the Kinks because... I think if the Kinks weren't busy knocking the shite out of each other and getting banned from international touring and all this kind of stuff, I think they are one of the bands that probably would have had a shot at it. Like a Stone Cold I agree. shot at it. I agree, because they had the rock edge. Yeah. And we know from later on, they had the ability to kind of reinvent themselves like the Absolutely. Beatles were already doing. Exactly. So yeah, yeah, I'd have to agree with that. Um, so the, I put it all day and all the night just because it's... It's a killer, obviously, um, and it's one of their most well-known songs. We weren't pulling mad stuff out of out of the uh, the bag here. We're picking no, kinda... we're picking bands rather than the playlist. But the exactly, playlist will yeah. still be very interesting. Though. It is actually. I listened to it earlier. It's pretty good. Uh, so formed in North London, nineteen sixty-four. So they're already a little bit late to the game, a tiny bit late to the game. Yeah. Um, the the Kinks were only briefly part of the British invasion of the USA. Um, they were banned from international touring. In the US, uh, uh, USA touring after a lot of stories of how they were killing each other on these other tours. Yeah, um, that's going to fuck up your your whole yeah. uh, plan of being beating the Beatles. Exactly. <laughs> I think they done. I think they maybe hit the states once, and that was it. It was over and done with. Well, these bands pretty much had to be jet setting back and forward constantly, or else setting up shop in the states in order to actually make a dent. And they're still doing all right. They still doing all right. Um, but in 1965, when the invasion was in full swing and pretty much every band that was on the radio in the States was a British band, they weren't allowed to go over. to. They could sell, sell their records over there, but they weren't allowed to tour. And that was a big, <laughs> you big problem. You have to be touring. Yeah, yeah. you got to be touring. you got to be on the TV show. Were they allowed on the TV shows? <laughs> no, no. Uh, you got to yeah. do that. No, because there was, there was footage of them like braining each other and sending each other to hospital and all. Um, 
So like, we talked about the Kinks before, but one of the stories I think is that the the drummer hit the I think the bassist or one of the guitarists with a high hat stand and literally opened them up and ran off the yeah. stage because he thought he'd killed them. He was evading the law for days afterwards because <laughs> um, he thought he'd killed uh, his uh, his bandmate on stage in front of thousands of people. He literally mm. like opened up his head with a high hat stand. And uh, because they were constantly killing each other, were constantly fighting, it was just an insanity. They couldn't get over it. Um, so they done all right <coughs> um, in terms of like sales and singles and stuff like that. They had five top ten singles in the USA, which is pretty decent. Um, it is, yeah. What, the the only thing about I, I was thinking about this today, and there has to be a little kind of caveat here that these any British band attempting to sell singles and albums in the States would have been selling 10 times more than they would have three years previously. There was just this like sponge-like want for British bands in America. And the kids were going apeshit over uh, English bands. So once the rumour was out, there's a new British band, this is their single. They didn't even hear it, they were buying it. So sales they're the were... Next, they're the next Beatles. Exactly, guys. every single person. Sales used every... every, every they're the Beatles time. on speed. I think you'll find the Beatles are already on speed, but yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> we've also, we've got this interesting, uh, I'm, I'm sure it'll come up in yours as well, there's this interesting fight of the images where the Beatles are being portrayed as like the clean cut, uh, yeah. British, invite them home to have tea with our mammy type of deal. Even yeah, though I, didn't, I didn't know until I started researching this that this was such a big thing. Yeah, that was a, that was a big deal that like they looked like, you know, your mammy and daddy had loved them. But like it, realistically, they were probably the dirtiest out of all of them. You know what I mean? They were just being scumbags. But yeah. uh, th- there was a big thing about American values and, you know, the mom, pop and apple pie type of, type of malarkey that was going on. Yeah. And which type of these British bands that w- would fit into the way... Um, America expected their act to act, essentially. So, yeah, five top 10 singles in the USA. They had 70 in top 20 singles in the UK and five top 10 albums in the UK. They, after they were banned from touring, they had to concentrate on the UK and Europe. It, that was, yeah. that's why a lot of the time you'll talk to people in the States and they'll, they'll know, you know, one or two of the big King songs, but it won't, it won't have made such a kind of cultural impression upon them. But I do yeah. honestly believe They were more that. picked up, they were more picked up later. Yeah. Around, yeah. around the late seventies and the eighties where people started getting into talking heads and stuff like that. They exactly. Were like listen to the Kings at the same time, but they became yeah. a kind of cult uh, college kind of band. Yeah, there was there was a, there was like the the Kinks, and then you went into like the Buzzcocks into the seventies then as well that were doing all this weird stuff that nobody really noticed until slightly afterwards. And now at the same time, they were definitely trend setting in the sixties. Like they were one of the first bands to start using um, kind of Indian tonation in their songs and sitars and stuff. Um, mm. So like they were doing, I think like a year before Norwegian Wood came out, which would have been the big kind of uh, Indian inspired sitar song for the Beatles. They the um the Kinks had already done it and apparently the Beatles had heard the Kinks version but went, What the fuck is that instrument? What is this? This is mental and that was one of the things that kick started everyone having a shot at doing Indian stuff yeah. in their in their music. Um they actually even beat the Beatles at one stage. They beat um in nineteen sixty six they beat the Beatles paperback writer with Sunny Afternoon in 90, 1996 and they've released twenty four albums. Now again they they had multiple kind of incarnations as well I'm going to throw out random numbers but it doesn't matter the Beatles were around for a finite amount of time the Kings kind of came and went and came and went and came and went and came and went we'd almost be better off adding up how many solo albums the Beatles put out after the Beatles knocked it on the head as well as Beatles albums to to, to bring some of these other groups up to scratch and um, what we're talking about but the Kings is definitely my number one choice like I said they 1964 kick off kind of puts them in the middle of the, the hype and I don't think they had time to. I don't think they had time to kind of settle into their new roles as like this big British band. I think they went from kind of playing small venues in the UK and getting used to being a band and writing songs because everyone was having songs written for them. This was a big deal that like very few bands yeah. were writing their own songs back then. Like it wasn't yeah. a thing, and so they didn't even get a chance to start getting this kind of ball rolling. And all of a sudden, they're kind of being put on planes and being compared to the Beatles. And these are lads who've been in the band for about a year now. You know, so yeah. uh, it was a big shock to them, especially with the, those type of those those attitudes and characteristics that are kind of on them personally. Where they're just going to end up rounding with each other. They're obviously rough and tumble lads, so you put a lot of pressure on them. The first and thing, brothers. exactly, and the first thing that happens then is they're just going to start knocking the bollocks out of each other, and that's going to cause a weird dynamic in the band, which is going to cause two camps. 
which is always the way you know whenever you, you, we've seen it with Oasis going back to that you, you know you were Noel Goy or a Liam Goy like, and the band then have to decide as well you know yeah. and it's it's horrible but my choice for number one like I said the Kinks I think if they had had their shit together um, I think if they had of had maybe slightly better management and representation they definitely had the songs to go up against the Kings um, there's other bands here that had one or two songs that were capable yeah. but in terms of like you know with discography the Kinks were knocking out knocking out of the park and everything was different like you said they were changing and morphing and it was very liquid and flowing and they'd have one album where they sounded like this and the next one was Mad Poppy and the next one had this kind of the birth of this raga rock thing that was happening with the sitars and Indian influence and even Middle, Middle Eastern influences and stuff like that yeah. which was the beginning of kind of popular world music there was a lot of that happening um, at the time yeah I think I think the Kinks had the songs yeah, I don't know if they had as many as the Beatles, but no. we'll, we'll never know. We'll never know. Yeah, too far, many breakups America, and fights. America and, would have, yeah, taken them exactly. Again. They also d- didn't seem to be that they were writing songs um, together as such. It seems like they were killing each other and one lad would show up with uh, a song, and the rest of them would just learn it. So there wasn't that. It wasn't being yeah. filtered through two or three decent songwriters to being. Yeah, they probably didn't want to add, add that into the fights as well. Exactly. Just so like, they just went like, right, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's that song ground next okay so uh, that's uh, the Kings who is your first one my first one is Manfred Mann mm. uh, I think are like an alternative universe Beatles yeah like, if you got warped to, to a different world and they had to like do I don't know a fucking Rick and Morty or whatever alternative versions of things yeah you'd see Manfred Mann there as the Beatles because they were well, they're from London for a start mm. So it's a bit, it's a bit of difference there. Beatles were ultimately from sixty three to sixty nine. Yeah. Manfred Mann were sixty two to sixty nine. Mm. It's the exact same time frame, realistically. The Beatles were covering Chuck Berry, the Marvelettes, and the Shirelles. Manfred Mann were covering Muddy Waters, the Exciters, and the Shirelles. Mm. Um, Manfred Mann were named after their South African-born keyboard player, Manfred Lubavitz. Mm. I don't know how it's just how you pronounce it. Um, they were at the time like I said, either purposely or inadvertently rivaling the Beatles mm. during the exact time frame. They racked up uh, 30 in top 10 singles in the UK. The thing is, though, they were a really, really, the difference between them is they were a really, really adept jazz mm. music band who only decided to do pop, I think, because it was popular. Mm. Well, that's, that's the, name of, the name of pop music. Um, but they were playing stuff like John Coltrane and Miles Davis without a bother on them. They were a proper... Mm serious jazz band that just went you know what fuck let's try this crack yeah, like yeah. it looks like fun so they did uh, they signed with EMI within uh, a, within a year of forming mm. and after a successful interview where they played a load of it's not like the Beatles at all the stuff they were playing in, in, the, in the EMI audition it was a fusion of like jazz and R&B so they brought the R&B aspect in to make it a little bit more palatable for audiences mm. and that's when the A&R guy went you need to change your name to uh, Manfred Mann hmm. uh, against the wishes of Manfred Mann himself he was like please don't <laughs> this is weird and uh, they're like and like, no it's cool it's so mm. cool Manfred Mann and they're, they'll think like, this like they'll, they'll, they'll think the lead singer is Manfred Mann is the keyboard player so just went right ground with it um, so they were a huge part of the 60s invasion and uh, touted of course as another Beatles they had a massive song in 67 with the Mighty Queen, which actually sounds to me like a Paul McCartney song. Mm. If you sing that, come on, will it, come on, will it? <laughs> that sounds like a fucking Paul McCartney song. Yeah. To be honest with you. It's actually written by Bob Dylan, though, believe it oh, or not. Oh, well. It's one of his. They broke up in 69 um, because they didn't want to do this pop stuff anymore. They were mm. like, yeah, no, no, I want, I want, like, whatever. We did this. I think that was an experiment to see how far they could push it. But ultimately, if you grow up playing a certain type of music and you're it's really difficult to play that kind of music. Mm. Backtracking so much into pop yeah. for so long and then not being able to keep going, you know what? So Manfred Mann left and started Manfred Mann Chapter 3, which was a kind of purest jazz thing. And then after a few years when people didn't want to know, he went, mm. right, I'll try again. So we started Manfred Mann's Earth Band, which more people, I think, are familiar with in America now because mm. they had that huge hit with Blinded by the Light, the Bruce Springsteen uh, song. Absolute banger. Yeah. So that's coming more towards Poppy Prague in like I think that was the seventies, yeah. So did they come close? Not really. Mm. No, were they trying to I don't even know if they were really trying to. I think they are 
honestly were like the whole time going, we'd blow these cunts off the stage realistically, <laughs> musically. But let's try. So I think they had more music talent, mm. but that doesn't mean shit if you don't have the songwriting talent. And I yeah. think they wrote some great songs, and they but they covered mostly. They covered mostly is the thing. Mm. I think they didn't write as many of their own. That was a big um, thing. So, like I said, they were a big part of the British invasion alongside the Beatles, but not a beater. Mm. Let's, I couldn't get a number of albums sold by these guys. It's particularly difficult to find some bands sailed. Yeah, I couldn't really get their difficult. sales at all, but I know they had three UK number ones. <coughs> That's not bad. That's not I, too bad. Yeah. 16 top tens. Mm. Uh, spent seven weeks at number one in total. And 65 weeks in the top 10 mm. in total. So that's Manfred Mann's, I would say Manfred Mann's Earth Band, because I'm used to calling him that. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, actually, yeah. I actually prefer, I don't know which ones I prefer. He's, he's, he's a crazy character, that guy. I mm. never listened to Chapter 3 now. I'm not into the jazz stuff at all. Yeah. But I do like some Manfred Mann stuff, and I do like some Earth Band stuff. But yeah. that's, they came out at the same time. I, I think they wanted to replicate the Beatles, but mm. I they tried to rival. Did they really try to, in terms of the British invasion? They wouldn't be in the top five of the British invasion, but they tried. Yeah. Who's your next one? <laughs> My next one is the Yardboards. Oh, yeah. So, if we're talking about how bands are... Well, first of all, I picked Fire Love because it's a little smasher. Yeah. Um, it's, also the, the, it's also the song that kind of almost killed the band. But if we're talking about how these bands are being uh, kind of marketed and where they fit in because uh, there was a lot of bands going for the going for the crown but a lot of bands just weren't f- fit to hold the crown is the wrong word but they weren't stylistically going to scratch that itch so the yardboards were like the thinking man's kind of british invasion bands they were the yeah, very like much you have, you have to remember that I, I, we're talking about the 60s when no one knew that you couldn't beat the Beatles we're talking this now in retrospect where we yeah, go yeah. wow what yeah. they did but this is in the middle of it where the oh, Beatles yeah. maybe could be only coming out with Rubber Soul or something where you're like exactly. that's a bit different exactly. they're, they're, they're all still thinking we're going to beat them oh yeah absolutely I always yeah. think of it in terms of like kind of early 90s pop where like the Spice Girls come out and then all of a sudden you've got like Girls Allowed and All Saints and all these bands just start coming out of the woodwork because they're yeah. they, they either kind of half existed or they were created but they were all they were all aiming for the same kind of point in the mountain but they were all scratching a different itch if you get me um, yeah 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 and like all the, boy bands kind of did as well exactly like f- five are not the same as the Backstreet Boys exactly exactly like they were, they, there's a, the whole idea behind sorry like, they're actually quite close I meant that not like boys on a Westlife yeah they were, they were t- yeah five more along the lines of that but yeah like we're, I just have to remind people that you're talking about bands trying to beat the Beatles we're talking about in that era where oh, yeah. they were there they and then well, we know now they weren't beatable yeah. but at there the time exactly yeah yeah Exactly. Was like when Mazzoni's opened this country and everybody was able to get like really good pizza on the corner, how many other pizzerias popped up around the other corner and disappeared? Yeah. But at one time, they might have been just as good, if not better, you know? <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> the Yardboards were like the thinking man's kind of band. They were a little bit more serious. They were very, very much virtuoso. So, I mean, you're talking about a band that spawned Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton, you know? They all it's came mad. out of the Yardboards. Madness. Saying, you know? They're a pro super t- super group. But like the, pro oh, super exactly group. like Led Zeppelin were originally called the New Yardboards. They were supposed to be an extension of the Yardboards. You know, they just kind of grew legs and um, a lot, a lot of music kind of purists. As much as they will love Led Zeppelin, they'll tell you that like Zeppelin kind of paled in comparison to what the Yardboards were doing. The Yardboards was a pure, a very pure version of what Zeppelin were trying to do. Um, like I love Led Zeppelin, but Zeppelin were hiding an awful lot of stuff in kind of drum solos and guitar wankery and stuff like that. Like yeah. the songwriting was there, but the songwriting was there in its purest form with the yardboards also. So formed in nineteen sixty three. Um they split in sixty eight and they kinda of, they they kinda of rocked back and forward between splitting up and getting back together again a bunch of times. Like every time someone left, like Eric Cla- Eric Clapton left the band the day this single Fire Love came out. Because he hated it, well, uh, he did not want to do the whole poppy shtick that uh, the record labels were pushing. Because the record labels were saying, like, this band of Beatles are just selling absolutely outrageous amount of money, and we reckon you could write a deadly little pop song as well. So they did, and Eric Clapton's like, "That's not blues. Like, I only want to play blues. The Yardboards yeah. are a blues band, and 
he, he hated it, even though we kind of co-wrote it and all this kind of stuff. He was like, I don't want to be part of this band. And the day the single came out, he was like, absolutely not. So, like, if the Beatles were your kind of angelic pop masters, you know, banging out catchy tune after catchy tune, um, and the Stones were the dirty, sexy, sweaty Brits, the Yardboards were, like, the Thinking Persons band, like, wildly experimental and with extraordinary skills. Like, just... Um, like I said, he left the band that day. It's... It's... Uh, he went on, obviously, Eric Clapton went on and then to do his own thing. They brought Jimmy Page in as a bassist, actually. Jimmy Page was there and he fecked off and Beck came in. But people tend to prefer... Sounds the, like a, sounds like a, a bar super group. We'll bring you a Jimmy Page yeah, on. Yeah, a queen yeah, of he's de- a guitar player. Oh, yeah, just exactly. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. A lot of people do start off on a different sort of... It's, it's, it's interesting the stuff they've done because it's such a... As the different players came into the band, the band start widening their scope like they always had that kind of bluesy feel to it but like if you want to hear like one of the songs that almost invented heavy metal listen to the train kept the rolling by the yardboards it's insane i was talking about like a chugga chugga trash metal riff you know what i mean it's it's mental and, and even the way the vocals are done like it's not growly but they got these real stabby vocals in between just like, yeah. and there's no there's no majors or anything it's not it's not poppy it's not nice it's evil like it's it's actually evil <laughs> and uh, like you can hear how many like, they, they only put out four studio albums before they knocked them in the head and like I said Jimmy Page they wanted to get he wanted to keep going because uh, Jeff Beck the, the Jeff Beck incarnation of the band was the one that most people tended to like because he, he was a real kind of real riff master you know and everything he played was sounded completely different and he, his his style sat in he wasn't trying to stand out like like Clapton he was happy enough to sit in but like coming up with cool riffs that would suit the band all the time but they had a shot um, they were one of the British Invasion bands as well, but they definitely fulfilled a, a slightly different demographic. I, I don't think they they had the moxie to ever have a crack at, like, the crown. Like, whatever about what the record label taught, they just, it wasn't going to yeah. happen for them. Like, well, it, like, if you think about how the Beatles, the Beatles set themselves up with nice music. Yes. Love Me Do. And yeah. it got huge and it's monstrous. And then they got to do what they wanted. The Yardboards wanted to do what they wanted from the get-go. Yes. And it doesn't work like that. But that's okay for them, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, mm. it's... If... Like you said, if the, if the Beatles... I mean, the, Be- the, the the original style of the music that the Beatles were playing was called Mersey Beat. And there was a British invasion band called the Mersey Beats. Do you know what I mean? That's how much of a crap like yeah. uh, cash in that we're dealing with and the Yardboards most certainly were not doing that I mean if, if Eric Clapton one of the most famous guitarists of the world, in the world and he was well known even in the Yardboards like this is nothing to do with me like let the Beatles be the Beatles I'm going to play I want to I want to stick the fucking cigarette in the in the strings of the guitar and play for 20 minutes just jamming you know what I mean that's what he wants to do the rest of the band not so much to like we love all that but let's write some pop songs and make a lot of money. And he's like, I don't give a shit about money. Off I go. Um, I don't think they had the, the the pop sensibility to do it. They definitely would have been kings of a hill. You know what I mean? But that mountain, yeah. they weren't. I don't think they were ever getting near it. But they turned out to be more important than popular. I think in the yeah. in the long run. Um, but that's uh, that's my second one. That's the yardboards. And I, I like listen, the yardboards. I always find are almost like the, the trip-hop of the 60s, in that you can throw it on if you're doing something else. And every now and again, your brain kind of tune into something they're doing, and you go like, holy shit, like, that's yeah. pretty cool. But like, there's loads of stuff there that's just almost jam rock, and some of the albums have, like, 30 songs on them. It's insane. Um, <laughs> like, there's just such a range of stuff in there, and it's perfectly good background music that you will your brain will tell you when it's time to listen. If you get me, yeah, as opposed yeah. to that full frontal assault that you got from a lot of these kind of sixties pop bands. So uh, yeah. that's the Yardboards. Who's your next one? My next one are a band who I get mixed up with Manfred. I used to, as a kid, get mixed up with Manfred. Man, <laughs> it's uh, Herman's Hermits. And um, we used to get them mixed up a lot as a kid. I used to call once. I think I used to think Manfred Mann wrote the song I picked, "No Milk Today," and Herman's Hermits Hermits wrote uh, whatever like fucking <clears throat> Manfred Mann songs. They came along around around the same time. So they're 63 to 71. It's mm. all around the same time frame with these bands. That time where early 60s and then killing it around 71 when mm. they, had t- they were tired. And that British invasion had died down mm. so much that bands were either breaking up or just 
they had to change their sound completely. Mm. Um, they're a brand from Manchester who were a big part of it as well. So they're like, could be considered the Manchester Beatles if mm. it wasn't already given to Oasis by now or something, I'm sure. Their chart debut was a cover of Jerry Goffin and Carol King's song, I'm Into Something Good, which is a banger. Mm. It's used in so many movies. Um, the, in September, that replaced the kinks you really got me from the charts. Mm. So there you go. That was how big they were kind of getting at the time. And that went to number one. Yeah, that went to number one, beating that. And in general, they had 13 number one hits in the US. Mm. Like, that's fucking huge. That's what made me think, shit, they are way bigger than I thought they were. 13, sorry, no, it reached 13 in the US charts. They had some number one hits. I was like, mm. okay, hang on a second. No, hang on. They didn't have 13 number one hits in the... <laughs> the Beatles had like 27. Mm. So how did they have 13? No, they didn't. It reached number 13 in the US, which is yeah, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I'll have their list. I'll have their numbers later on. Um, they were pretty heavy hitters. John Lennon become go- became good friends, friends with Herman, Herman the Hermits. Yeah, Jesus yeah. Christ. That was a tongue twister. Mates <laughs> were Herman, Herman's lead singer Peter Noon. Um, John Lennon used to get him into bars when they were hanging around together because he was only seventeen at the time. Uh, he left the band in nineteen seventy one. Mm. I think again, this is around the time people went knock this shit on the head. The Beatles have broken up. We're not going to try and keep it. We can get to do whatever mm. we want to do now. And um, they reunited in seventy three. Right, get this to headline a British reinvasion tour or some bullshit. Oof. And the last gig they played was in Madison Square Garden. So wow. in 73, with their singer gone, they still got to finish their tour in Madison Square Garden. That's how mm. big Herman's Hermits were. But not so much in England. They were big in England, but not as big as they were in America. Mm. Um, I feel like these and another band I'll mention later were their two Beatles' two biggest rivals at the time. Mm. They attribute some of their success to being super clean and marketable on US television. Mm. Like Man- Herman's Hermits, Manfred's man, man, you could tell we're fucking into drugs. Yeah, There's yeah, no yeah. way looking at Manfred Man, you don't think. <laughs> they had the mad beards and yeah. the like, the big thick rimmed glasses and the longer hair. Herman's Hermits were just doing everything that by the book. But their songs were still bangers. Like they really, yeah, really yeah, were. Yeah. Um, they didn't have the association with any kind of drugs, and they didn't go near jazz music like Manfred Manns did. So let's talk success, right? Mm. Between the late six, late, late 1964 and early 68, they never failed to reach the top 40 in America mm. with uh, 11 of their songs. Deadly. Six of them, six of their top 10s in America never were even uh, released in England. That's how they had yeah. just not... A lot of bands go like that. I think that happened to yeah. a few bands like Bush. Once you find your home... <laughs> And it happens with bands going to Germany as well. Once you find your home, get, it, it's sort of no point releasing music back in England if mm. it's not going to do well. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. You're going to cut your losses with it and go, right. So they were bigger in the States than they were in the UK. That's why you don't really hear much of Herman's Hermits being yeah. talked about in the same vein as the Beatles. But they were, if you take out one of the bands you're going to mention earlier, because they're, some of the bands that we mentioned, are, they are part of the British invasion, but they're not really part of the same sound. Mm-hmm. and these were these were in the top five of the British top four maybe even yeah uh, the lead singer Peter Newen who used to be a child actor uh, in Coronation Street mm. I mentioned he left in 71 and that year he covered a song from a struggling one hit wonder artist mm. from London uh, who had a song about like a spaceman he actually played <laughs> keyboards on this song oh, okay. and that song was Oh You Pretty Thing yeah. and that lad was David Bowie <laughs> so Oh You Pretty Thing was released uh, just before David Bowie got really big. I'm actually watching in the middle of watching that film Stardust now. Mm. Um, it's okay. It's got no David Bowie music in it, so That's it's right, yeah. almost pointless. But it's sort of interesting to see him on the road trying to play his trade. But before David Bowie got big, or in '71, Peter Noon recorded that song. He went, "Jesus, this is a great song." Yeah, should, uh, you should come and play keyboard with me. You know. Here's another little fact about them. Their song, Henry, Henry the Eighth, I Am, was the fastest selling song in history at the time. That's, just, that's destroyed any fastest selling Beatles song. Yeah. Um, that's, thank, that's thanks to being on the in, TV in the, mm. in the States. They only had one UK number one. That was that song. Mm. They only had 10 UK top 10s. I didn't get the U- US one. I couldn't find their US stuff. Again, very difficult. Uh, apparently, singles and albums 
together, 80 million. Wow. That's what blew my mind. 80 million. Now, the Beatles, let's put it into perspective. Uh, now, this is certified sales. They're over 230, I think, million. Yeah. That's, that's just certified. Crazy. They're, the, the, it's claimed that they're 600 million. <sighs> I don't know what that includes. What, pre-charts or bootlegs or what? Yeah. Well, so that's what the Beatles are. So to even have 80, 80 million in records. That's insane. Is huge. Like I said, I had to mention them because they're, people in America of a certain age will go, Herman's Hermits? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. But in England, yeah, they were just, I think, you know what I think? I think at some stage people went in England, but, but we have the Beatles. I think so. So, so we don't need, like, and there were, some of these bands were going straight directly over to America. Oh, yeah, yeah. A, bit of a, a little bitterness. Almost about, certainly. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, sort of like, now look, we've got the Beatles and that's all we really, really need. So that was Herman's Hermits. I think they're really, really up there. Yeah. As Beatle rivals around that time. Definitely. They're knocking the Kings off, not quite knocking the Beatles off. Yeah. But, uh, Definitely. And it's good to know that they were mates with the Beatles as well. Mm. Uh, or at least the, the two lead singers. Mm. Were. Who's your next one? My next one is The Hollies. And right. the, the Hollies is interesting because I, I, I wanted to look at a band that followed a very similar trajectory to The Beatles. So uh, I picked The Hollies, The Air That I Breed, um, which again, another little killer. Yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, band formed in 1962, and they were actually picked up by a record label when they were playing in the Cavern Club. So they're right. playing the Cavern Club, and uh, dude comes over and goes like, hey, you are pretty decent. I think they might have even had the same uh, band manager as the Beatles um, at the start Yeah, as well. for anyone who doesn't know, the, the Cavern was the, the Beatles. Uh, yes. Was, I think that was, people know that. Exactly. Um, I actually have a... F- framed picture in my bathroom of the Beatles playing the Cavern Club for some reason really a yeah, painting of a, of a gig poster um, that I for some reason I've had for like 25 years I don't know where it came from it's just always yeah. being there I don't know where it came from and um, so they had they um, basically at the start they only done covers only ever done covers that was um, their shtick Uh and that kind of, because they were doing covers and they were covering a lot of American acts, that got them a bit of interest in the USA then. So that meant all of a sudden they were going over to the USA to play an awful lot during the kind of initial wave, the first wave of the British invasion. Uh, Bus Stop was their first top 10 US single, which done kind of big business for them. But it wasn't until 1966 and the band's fifth album that they start doing full albums of originals. Now, um, back when Elton John wasn't Elton John, he was playing piano. Um, in the studio for the Hollies. Was he? Yeah, he was, he was on a bunch of stuff. You can go and look at like the amount of stuff he played with them. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, it's... Um, oh, I, don't know I don't actually know a lot about the Hollies at all. Yeah, they're, they're very interesting. The Hollies is where uh, the beginnings of Crosby, Stills and Nash came from. So uh, Graham Nash was one of the guys in the Hollies and he lives and forms Crosby, Stills and Nash. Right. Um, uh, they they had issues apparently creating originals. Like they start writing their own songs and they weren't really doing they weren't doing the, the kinda the, the the business essentially. So they had to keep bringing in they kept bringing in outside songwriters. Now they were still messing with it themselves and they weren't necessarily covers, they were just using the kind of record label model of the time and that was they would have a bunch of people who would send in songs on the record label would buy the songs off the people and get double them out then to some of their acts. Um, so uh, they were decent performers, not the greatest writers in the world, not the strongest of writers. And uh, once they started doing original stuff, it was like, I don't know about this. And then all of a sudden, they had to start bringing in songwriters who gave them a dig out, and they st- that's where you start getting kind of some of their bigger hits. Um, they were one of, the, uh, one of the last bands to stick around in the States for the British invasion as well. They were kind of there for a lot of it, um, doing an awful lot of, st- of stuff in the States and one of the last bands to live. And uh, I think that, that that meant that they were, I think they might have been getting their, their feet underneath them in the States and then all of a sudden the rug was pulled out and every other band pulled out as well. You know, that the, the fad had kind of worn off and they yeah, might have I, I outside never really that what what the death of the British invasion thing was? Maybe you can only invade for so long, but I, I think don't so. Know. 
yeah, before you get pushed back. Uh, and uh, I think we've got a couple of bands coming up that were that definitely were the pushback. If you get me, yeah. um, they had four US top fifteen songs, which is the same as saying four top twenty songs. I don't know why uh, it says top fifteen. That's a bit weird. Well, because if, if I was top fifteen. I'd say top 15 instead of top 20. Yeah, it gives exactly. you an extra five, yeah, exactly. five move killer. Yeah, I would. Exactly. I would. Which means they were probably 14 or 15, realistically, let's be yeah. honest. Uh, they ended up releasing 17 albums in the US. Now, there's <coughs> one thing we have to talk about as well, that in the 60s, albums didn't sell particularly well. Uh Singles, yeah, sold. absolutely. It was singles, yeah. yeah. Especially in the States. England liked, al- liked albums. Europe liked albums. But the States loved singles now what this meant was um this is of a, 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 a particular bone of contention if you're a record collector if you collect vinyl is that there will be massive differences between albums that were released in the uk and albums that were released in the states in some cases there will be albums that were only released in england and albums that were only released in the states then there was albums that were essentially the best of so far but they were just given a new name so you'll end up seeing, we've talked about this in podcasts before, if the band had a big song, say that band, they're, they're, they have a song called Paint the Walls Red, and it'll mean right. that they'll take a load of singles and a load of whatever garbage they can get a hold of, press it onto a 12-inch and call it, whatever the name of the band is, and call it Paint the Walls Red, the album. And yeah. that was released then in the States. Um just it almost as a, as a follow-up. It was, just, it was all about chart singles. All chart not, singles. All Because yeah, uh, 45s were affordable for the kids and they were getting played in jukeboxes, in cafes and, and like soda pop fucking malt pharmacy chemist corner drugstores, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah. um, the bleeding at thing. the hop. Yeah, at, at the, the hop. hop, exactly. At the hop. Um, so that was a big deal. Well, Singles still sell well in England, but albums were the thing. People saw albums as better value for money. They were maybe twice the price of a single, but there was ten times more songs on them, and it made more sense, you know? Um, So, when I say the Hollies had 17 albums released in the US, they might have only had, like, 12 in the UK. Like, I I couldn't tell you. I'd have to go digging really deep. And um, I'm I'm not going digging really deep on the Hollies. The Hollies are fine. You know what I mean? They're grand. They were part they were, of this. They were, they were huge, but yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't go. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not taking the, the, the shovel and spade out here. I'm not I digging the memoria for it. Another Manchester band, actually, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think the band were, I think there was two people from, maybe two from Manchester, one from London, and one from like, somewhere weird, somewhere in the yeah, Midlands. Yeah. <laughs> um, they were kind of a make, make you up you kind of, uh, they didn't have a solid location. I don't, I don't think, I could be wrong now. Uh, but yeah, that, that, was, that was a big deal. It was a sing, single sold in the US, they didn't really sell um, in in the UK, not as well as the US. So everybody was looking for the killer single, the killer single, the killer single, and they didn't really give a shit about what was on the B-side either. Now, again, we've talked about this before. There's a whole podcast in B-sides, um, in B-sides that turned out to be bigger hits than the A's. This is including, including my next one, yeah, exactly. So that, like that's that, that, that's a that's a big deal as well. But uh, yeah, the Hollies, is, it, they, they were an in, interesting band. Just the fact that they had to follow the same trajectory. Cavern Club to the States. Couple yeah. of big singles. Um, and then, I think the Hollies are still going, actually. I'm pretty sure they're still going in some fashion. There's probably like a singer. And a lot of Just two still alive. 12 year olds. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, they, they birthed it, um, Crosby, Stills and Nash for us. And they gave us uh, Elton John. Elton John cut his teeth playing with the Hollies as well. I didn't know that at all now. Yeah, interesting band. I think there was someone else, someone else famous involved and I didn't write it down. Eric Clapton, probably. Yeah, exactly. I I remember reading it going like, I have to write that down and then I didn't. And then when it was over, I said, I better remember to write that down and I didn't and now it's gone. So uh, someone else can figure it out for me. We do our best, folks. We do our best. Yeah, exactly. Uh, That was the Hollies. Anyway, who is your next one? My next one, I'm going to move from Rivals to Mantles or Torches, maybe. And I'm going to pick ELO. All right, um, a lot. A lot of people are of the opinion that ELO s- sound like how the Beatles would have sounded like mm-hmm. in the 70s. And it's interesting because I don't know if it's, I don't know if that's true. Mm. Um, so these formed after the Beatles had broken mm. up. So Rivals, it fits into the Rivals in terms of they were touted by a lot of people, like I just said, as maybe ones to take over. Mm. So they accumulated more combined... UK and US top 40 hits than any other band in the world. Wow. 
Wow. From from that period, sorry, of 72 to 86. That's a huge period. Mm. 14 years of... of uh, we're talking... The, the, the amount of bands that came out during them. Yeah. They accumulated more combined UK and US top 40 hits in their bands in the world. Wow. So, many of those songs are inarguably Beatles-inspired. Yes. Simply just are. And I don't think it's even in question from Jeff Lynne or anyone. So, they could be... A band that could they have been a band that matched the Beatles' success mm. afterwards? They, well, they weren't, to be honest with you. Not really. They did so well, but we'll we'll come into the fact why they couldn't have really done that. I added one hundred five eight three overture. We've covered you've you've picked so that song good. for a different podcast before. Outrageous. It's amazing. That song was intended to be a B side in, yep. initially. Before I don't know how it works. Someone mm. a DJ picked it up, or someone in. A and R went no, put that out. This song is Dear Prudence meets I yeah. Am the Walrus. Yeah, absolutely is. But to be honest with you, <coughs> I prefer this to Dear Prudence, even mm-hmm. though it lifts a good bit from it. There was there's always going to be a massive link between uh, the Beatles and ELO anyway, since George Harrison and Jeff Lynne were from ELO were really That's good right, mates, yeah. and Lynne produced albums for George Harrison. He even performed and produced the Free as a Board single, mm. which is the 1995 Beatles demo turned into a single. You might remember, it's actually quite a nice song, uh, Free as a Board. I remember yeah. that in 1995 going, why are Beatles coming out with a song now? Isn't that Men and Dead? But it was a reworked demo, painstakingly, apparently, by Jeff Lynne mm. and uh, I think Harrison as well. The idea that they would have become taken over the mantle of, we know that now that, I don't know how you'd quantify that, yeah. Maybe they came the closest from the style of music. I don't really know. Um, for for a, for a genre band that had like almost a gimmick, do you know what I mean? Like ELO had a gimmick, and that was yeah. that all the biggest Beatles songs had orchestras in them. You know, had strings and horns, and they were like, let's make every fucking song the best Beatles song. You know what I mean? And even yeah. if it's not their strongest song in the world, we can hide it in savage violins and cellos. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that works, because me and you have talked about that before. You can make a song 7,000 times better by putting an orchestra behind it. Like, yes, I think so. Yeah. Depending on the song, but yeah, generally, we, yeah, generally it does for me to have a more yeah. epic feel. So, let's get into the point of, did they, could, did, did they sound like the Beatles would have went to? Mm. I think I can state categorically now. Simply because we know sort of what the Beatles would have sounded like. Yeah. Because we had a decade of them all making solo records. Exactly. So if you can sort of put together what it would have went like, maybe. Yeah. Maybe you could imagine Paul McCartney putting forward Mr. Blue Sky to the Beatles. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. But could you imagine John Lennon singing Mr. Blue Sky? No. Without being sarca- more sarcastic mm. and a bit more... Having a dig at it. See, ELO were great. Like, really, really great. But they didn't have that cynicism and sarcasm. And exactly. That, that, Very they upfront. Had, they had brilliant, like, absolutely mind-blowing stuff. And I honestly think they are their own band. We're talking about... We're comparing to the Beatles a lot, but, like, it's, it has to be done. It's the name of the podcast, so we have to do it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, I'm trying to think, like, now, I don't really know what the Beatles would have done if they'd have said together. We know what they all did separately and we can kind of get a general sound of it. Mm. But I don't know how John Lennon's music... <laughs> you see, I had a conversation with someone before when I said, I wonder what Nirvana would have sounded like if they had it kept going. Mm. I think they might have went to a more Radiohead style thing. I think so, yeah. A friend of mine said, absolutely not. Mm. I mean, what would they have done? Grunge is dead. They wouldn't have gone into new metal. They wouldn't no. have gone into classic rock. But no... They would have stripped their sound back. Way back, yeah. Very minimalist and experimental. Yeah. I don't think it's... No, he wasn't even saying experimental. This is stripped way back to like, where have you slept last night? That yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gone right back to that. And maybe with some more production values and strings and stuff like that. Yeah. I think it would have been a little bit more along the ter- lines of something in the way mm. and something like that. So it's really hard to fucking tell. It's really interesting to, to talk about where bands would have gone if they didn't. So... The Beatles would have, what I will say about this, and ELO, the Beatles would have definitely gone proggier. With all yeah. that 70s stuff around me, they did listen yeah. to what was going on around them. They just simply did. Uh, they would have went proggier. Uh, so did ELO rival the Beatles in terms of, oh, Jesus, absolutely not. Nobody does. Well, we, we actually, we can, we can talk about a couple of people who did rival yeah. that, that, that we didn't actually pick. We'll talk about them later. <laughs> I wanted to pick ELO because they were, 
I always associate them with the Beatles after the Beatles. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think we'd get somewhere, the Beatles would have been somewhere between ELO, Supertramp and 10CC. Yeah. But Very much. More sarcastic. Although 10CC were quite sarcastic. Um, and those are the three bands that, I, that we always talk about, me and you, yes. as being possible torch holders yeah. after the Beatles. ELO, Supertramp and 10CC in the style of mad fucking English bands. Mm. Mad fucking mad stuff. So for me, <laughs> I think the the Jesus, it's Queen really for me after the Beatles. Mm. To take over from the mantle of the Beatles. If I had to, if I had to say it, I'd have to say Queen. They also have the record sales to uh to match them. They can Not go match up, them. I think I think go my up. my next choice and Queen, I think, are the two contenders. Let's let's call them the fucking princes. Yeah. To the to the kings, you know what I mean? That that sitting sitting right there and they kind of had to wait until the Beatles stepped down before they yeah. exploded. And I think at some point Jeff Lane probably thought, right, we could go this far. Because I think oh, the yeah. songs are good. That that good. I really did think they would. They're mm-hmm. better than anything that the Beatles singularly put out in their solo careers. Yes. That time. So thank fuck for ELO. Because you had a ver- I think you have a version of the Beatles. A spiritual successor. Not... Mm. They're not matching. They're not matching the, no. the success anyway. But uh, the, the problem with the ELO is they change their sound so much because exactly. they could. They're so talented that they could change their sound so much. So they had uh, only one number one UK single. I think it was Mr. Blue Sky. Yeah, uh, fifteen top tens, two weeks solidly at number one again. I think that's just Blue Sky on his own. Mm. Uh, it has to be if they only had one, and fifty-one weeks in the top ten. That goes to show that they had many, many songs. Mm. Fifty-one weeks in the top ten is quite a lot over their career. I think they sell 50 million records, which is actually really good. Mm, uh, but again, we're talking about numbers on the internet. ELO, exactly. spiritual success to the Beatles, not quite a rival, uh, not a quite an after the fact rival either, but very near and dear to me. I knew mm, I think so. Absolutely. Oh, I Who's your next one? My next one is the Rolling Stones. Mm. Um, the Rolling Stones. <laughs> How do you even quantify this in you know, on, on, a, on a podcast? See, um, I couldn't pick. I couldn't pick them. I, I I had to pick them just to get as far as I'm concerned. If if the Kinks were going to be possibly one of the bands, and uh, like you said, like Hermits, Hermits, like they, if these were going to be bands that like came very close, but something stopped them. Nothing stopped the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones where like the forefront of the British British invasion. If the Beatles were already over there in the fortress, then the British invasion was being commanded by the Rolling Stones. They're like And it's cause it's cause they were playing American music. Exactly. Like their entire thing is based on like Delta Blues and kind of bits of jazz and stuff like that. Yeah. Um interesting band as well. Like I, we've talked about it before. Like I like the Rolling Stones, but like I'd be happy enough with like a double CD version of the best of the Rolling Stones. I just they're not really my bag. There's too much faffing about now. And but when they do write a killer, it's a killer like it's it's that simple. Um yeah. in terms of numbers, I think they're the closest band to take Take the take the crown. They're very very close. Yeah. Um, <coughs> however, they didn't even put a voice. In the, there was a little voice in my head going, "You know, the Rolling Stones and the Who are, and the Beatles are the top three. Like, oh yeah, somewhere. yeah. I didn't want and to touch head, the Who. To, in my head, yeah. in my head, my little voice went, but they can't be compared to them because they sounded totally different. And I yeah. know we didn't make up that rule. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was something in my head going, "Don't put the Rolling Stones <laughs> because." They are their own thing. Yeah, they can. They're so big that they weren't really rivaling the Beatles. Exactly. But they fucking were though. Everybody was. It's just that simple. So we're talking about how they sort of did. Yeah. Like, so yeah, I had to get that out of the way. They didn't rival them for sound. They're totally different. But to be honest with you, there's not a fucking day that went by. I'd say about from '63 mm. to the end of the Beatles, where fucking John Lennon didn't think what are the fucking Rolling Stones doing this week. Oh yeah, so absolutely. They, they were 100 percent looking at each other. We talked about uh, her Satanic Majesties going up against um, going up against Sergeant Peppers and stuff like that. Like it's like uh, there's mad parallels between between the Stones. Like now, however, the Rolling Stones didn't put out their first originals album until 1966. You know what I mean? That's now, mad. It's, yeah, it's batshit mad. Again, we were talking more covers, just all covers all the time um, at the start. Now, it has to be said that it wasn't until the very early 70s that the Stones 
exploded. Like, they were big in the 60s. Don't get me wrong. But in 1971, they released Sticky Fingers, their album. And the, the lead single after that is Brown Sugar. And that begins a run of eight in a row number one albums in the USA. Like, eight in a row number one albums in the USA. That's yeah. a big deal. They're the fourth best-selling band of all time with 240 million albums. Jesus, that could be... That could be more than the Beatles simply from for longevity that's like, all as I said earlier a lot of these bands are still going and it's incredibly difficult to, you, you'd have to sit down year by year and work out sales I'd say if you've done year by year boy the years that the Beatles were active the oh, Beatles, Beatles were smashing them well but, if you think about this right your numbers there are only 10 million above the Beatles in total <laughs> exactly now I have then again, then again no one's buying the, the 90s voodoo fucking stuff in the in the like in the hundreds of millions it's it's interesting here i have the beatles statistics here right so the first album they release in the states is please please me in 1963 first u.s single is love me do in 1962 right first u.s album number one comes out in 1964 um album sales in total of over 600 million from beginning to end worldwide 600 million Across the world, right? Yeah. Now, that will include compilations and live and all. That's not just studio albums. That's everything. 600 million. That's 17 UK number ones. And they released, in total, 213 singles worldwide. Now, that just goes to show you how many times that the record labels were kind of dishing out and selling out random album tracks to some random label to reproduce in Sri Lanka. You know what I mean? Like some random album fucking number 13 on the album it's getting released yeah. as a single in some random country so because like, 213 songs is absolutely outrageous um i think abbey road holds the record for a really weird statistic and because it went number one in 1969 and it went number one in 2019 40 49 years apart um i think that's a that's a guinness world book of records statistic for them so in terms of numbers like they're super strong but from what we can make out here the stones are very like they're up there as well they again they had the same manager as the beatles um at the start as well they were also signed to decca records who turned down the beatles at, the start. Right. Yeah, at least they, they were making that mistake again exactly Ooh. so uh, apparently when word in the street was these guys are the new beatles decca were like oh, they still had their head in their hands and they were like get them get them here and because of that they were they have they had a really weird record uh contract as well really weird they were getting triple the royalties that any other band that were signed in that era were getting triple the royalties. They also maintained ownership of their uh, master tapes. Yeah, only is, one other band in this podcast have done that. Exactly. In this, uh, in this playlist have done that. Also, uh, Lennon and McCartney wrote songs for them, for their albums. So That's mad. They didn't go up against each other. Uh, so I'm looking at their statistics. They had 30 studio albums, which is fucking crazy. 30 studio albums, 23 live albums, released 120 singles, right? Now, 120 singles over an entire lifetime compared to the Beatles down 213 in a very small amount of time. Um, just goes to show you the, the how... Did the Beatles really release that many singles? 213 worldwide, yeah. Yeah, and that, that would have... Like some of them will be... Some of them will be, some of them will be the same songs released twice and remasters and stuff like that as well. Right, right, right. right um, yeah. But 213 different singles released. Go on to Discogs and, and uh, go, into, go into the Beatles and organise by, by singles and you get to see all the different countries that released it. Now, what will happen in that 213, you'll get... Someone will release... Uh, uh, I am the walrus with the original B side, and then three years later it will be released with a different B side. That's considered a different single because it's right, that's got yeah. different uh, music on both sides of it. Um, looking at Rolling Stones, first ever UK number one, nineteen sixty four. Uh, first ever that was single, first ever UK album number one, nineteen sixty four. Um, first US album sixty five. Uh, first US number one single in 65 with satisfaction 10 UK number this ones is, this is around the same time now they would have completely had a completely different sound than they first started yes with. absolutely at the start <coughs> at the start like I said they were covering a lot of soul songs and kind of Delta Blue songs and kind of rocking them up a little bit yeah it was it took them like they formed in 1962 and it's 66 before they put out a first album of originals so it's four years of Anthony Pollux. Now, I think on a couple of the albums before 1966, they would have had a couple of originals, but a lot of them would have been 
um, uh, covers as well, mixing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like eight number one singles. Like, the, the, the Rolling Stones numbers aren't, they're not bananas good, if you get me, um, in terms of kind of sales. They seem to be like a, a band that you kind of chug along, um, that do really well, but as they progressed, like you only need to listen to kind of paint the black next to brown sugar. They're so different, and they they have no play, similarities. Play, play with fire as well. Yeah, play with fire is well. Play with fire is more along the lines of painted black. Mm. Dark. They have dark songs. Really dark. Oh yeah, songs. absolutely, big time. It, it's it seems to be an interesting dichotomy of who's writing the song and what they think the people want. And I think because of that, because they're not pushing out mad pop bangers. Like you said, they're doing kind of dark stuff and evil stuff, and then they're doing dirty old style music as well. They're never, they're not going to be as popular with the mammies and daddies, you know, bopping around the fucking living room of Ooh. a Saturday night. You know what I mean? Um, but in terms of sales, real strong, like real strong. In terms of brand recognition, one hundred percent. Like if you took, you took a hundred random people, and kind of played little bits and pieces of most of the bands that we're talking about here you'll get people they're going to recognise Beatles they're going to recognise Rolling Stones they'll recognise maybe the Kinks maybe like maybe Herman's Hermits or something like that you know like and they'll know the songs to home but they won't know anything about the band or who's in the band but there's something about they couldn't name the names a lot of people wouldn't have even named the names of the Kinks. Exactly, like it's it's in terms of the, their cultural impact. The the Rolling Stones are certainly in the top three, top three four of bands that from that era. Like you know, so that that's kind of why I wanted to uh, I wanted to bring them up because a they're still going, and uh, b they were going during that time and they were like massively popular massively yeah. popular I think they were seen as a little bit more kind of cooler like, like uh, if they, were, they were way cooler with like kind of models and uh, artists and stuff yeah, like that very much that. like the even there they had a, they went through glam being the Rolling Stones fine oh, yeah. they, they passed that oh yeah, yeah fine. 100% like, at the start now when they were taking photos of the Stones to, to advertise them they were uh, like, they weren't allowed to smile or anything like that there was no, you couldn't look like cheeky chappies. Like they, they went out of their way to advertise the Rolling Stones as if the Beatles are the ones that sit down with your mommy and daddy and have a lovely bit of lunch, the Rolling Stones will come in and wreck the gaff. That's yeah. the way they were advertised to America. And you because can tell of that. Them in their videos, in live videos, when Mick Jagger accidentally smiles a few times and his face just pulls back down yeah. to like a grimace. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're just designed in them to be, to look like they're a bit dangerous, you know. And uh, unfortunately, the way it went, it looked at like the, the Beatles were being aimed towards kind of the girl crowd, you know, the screaming kind of Beatle mania. And the, the Rolling Stones were like the cool dudes with the bleeding flick knives yeah. and the leather jackets. You know what I mean? No, that was the way it no, was being. There's no arguing that they are rivals. I just couldn't pick them because uh, I don't know what it is. It's so different. Because like, they're such an anomaly on their own now. Yeah. That like they don't do pop do songs. They, they yeah. never released a pop song. You know what I mean? Even but their the catchiest stuff though, is still rock and roll. At the same time, they are rivals when people go, are you Beatles or the Stones? It's a famous question. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, the answer is the Beatles. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the right time. Yeah, it's the right answer. And really. I like the Rolling Stones, but they've got a lot of fucking real garbage. Loud of and, and they've more garbage than the Beatles. The Beatles would yeah. have ended up with more garbage. Ah, they, absolutely. The Beatles were 40 killer, 60 crap. Yes. Although yes. later on it got a bit better. But Rolling Stones, I'm, I've listened to a lot of Rolling Stones albums and I've been there going, yeah, that's a lot of filler in there, man. <laughs> like a lot of yes, filler. Very much so. Very yeah. much so. Anyway, that was the Rolling Stones. Uh, who was your next one? We have to get out of England for this one, for the oh. first time, I think. And it is uh, the Beach Boys. Because mm. they are, or were, a Beatles rival. And there's yes. no way... And, and the reason I picked them is because I do associate their music with the Beatles mm. um, a little bit. Because they were fighting on... Well, they were fighting in America a lot. Mm. But they're from different parts of the world. And... Uh, the, the Beach Boys could be... If someone said to me the Beach Boys were the American Beatles, I wouldn't spend long disagreeing with that. Like, mm. I, I, I'm not, it doesn't sit really well with me, the statement, because it, it's not... But it's not it's not massively incorrect. Mm. It's it's pretty... If you were to break it down into one quick sentence, it's it's something you hear 
and it's not completely yeah. without merit. So they have 35 million certifiable sales and 100 million claimed. Mm. I feel like it should be more than that. I think I so. I really do. But I think that because maybe because they went in the direction that they went in later on, yeah. that's, that, that became more cult. They didn't sell that well at the time. They sold well now, but even then, nothing like the, the Beatles did. So they, that was, this is was the first great rivalry between a band outside the UK mm. for, for the Beatles. Mm. And the Beach Boys were, there's a lot of comparisons. They were very safe when they first started off, clean and wholesome, singing about Definitely, yeah. surfing. Whereas England, like... The, Can't surf, you'll die. The Beatles were talking about finding love on the bus. Mm. That's the closest thing they can come to surfing, realistically. <laughs> like, we're yeah. going out on a boat. I don't know. Yeah, it's not quite Yellow Submarine. It was later for all that. Um, but I do find it very hard to really compare the bands, mm. sounds and stuff like that. Until Pet Sounds, because they were only rivals in terms of sales before that. But mm. after Pet Sounds came out, they became sort of uh, creative rivals. And Paul and John were massive, massive fans of Pet Sounds. Oh, yeah. I'm kind of glad to hear that. There's an interview where John says that he told Brian Wilson, or sorry, that he he said that his arrangement abilities are incredible. Mm. Like so. I'm going to tell you right now, that's, that was the start of the influence for Sgt. Pepper's. That's, yeah. that's not even really questionable. Everyone says yes. that. I don't even know if the Beatles ever said that. I don't think they did. It's not something they'd say when it comes to their own music. But the stuff on Pet Sounds, the arrangement, that gave birth to Sgt. Pepper's. Yeah. yeah. Or at least, uh, yeah. Uh, John apparently told Brian Wilson on the phone, this is the greatest record I ever made. Mm. I think that might have been Paul McCartney's quote, though. Maybe. Um, Paul McCartney and Brian Wilson became really, really good friends. And Sounds like more of a McCartney thing to say than a Lennon thing. Yeah. Um, Beach Boys' influence for melodic bass lines, sorry, were more of a Sgt. Pepper's thing. The arrangements, I don't know. It's, I can't remember which came from. It is, is it Pet Sounds before Sgt. Pepper's? 66 and 68 or 67, I think it is. Because I, I know that they took their arrangements so that's 66 and it's how Sgt. Peppers is uh, seven. that sounds hang on god on we doing this on the fly here uh, yeah released in 66 is Pet Sound 66 uh, and 67 okay. for a thing it is 67, 67 68, so yeah it? I'm not wrong in saying the arrangements yeah. were there yeah. the arrangements definitely came into it yeah um, so the Beatles rivalry included influence from this band yeah so that is that's the first time we've seen this mm. not it, to be honest with you it was the first time we know of it yeah yeah because i know for a fact that the who influenced helter skelter by the beatles that's been admitted definitely in, in term not in terms of their sound that they got but it was because the beatles were protecting the throne the whole time if any i think they read it in enemy magazine the Who have written the heaviest song to ever come out of. <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. And then John Ellen was like, hang on a second. Oh, I can do that. We've well, talked about this before. That. The Who are the most underrated yeah. band. Underrated big band yeah. of all time. I wouldn't... I, the Who have a place in the rivalry for the Beatles, but I wouldn't pick them because I no. actually respect them too much to put them in that category. Yeah, they're also I'm more of a classic them. rock band, I think, than anything else. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's The Who versus Stones, if anything. On a yeah, separate, very much so, yeah. The Who versus Stones on a separate, separate page altogether. Yeah. Um, it's a huge deal to think of uh, the Beach Boys, a rival, a definite rival, yeah. influencing them so much. But they did. And um, yeah, that's all I really have to say about that. I yeah. think, like I said, the, the American Beatles, it's a very rudimentary, rudimentary statement, but it's mm -hmm. not. Did they match them in sales? Not quite. Did they match them in popularity? Overall, in the consciousness, mm. yeah, they're up there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, did they take over the mantle? Absolutely not. Those albums did not keep going. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. They, they, you thought they would have because the Beach Boys kept going. But I, uh, no, I, I think that, that that little experiment didn't sit well. Even though it sold well, it didn't sit sit well with the rest of the band. So it only sold well later on. It didn't yeah. sell well initially, and it yeah. didn't go down well. And the rest of the band didn't like it. So exactly. Yeah, uh, but it's an absolute institution of an album, Pet Sounds. Yeah. And if you don't own Pet Sounds, something wrong with you. Yeah, and if, if you like Sgt. Peppers as well. Exactly. Um, so who's your next one? My last one. 
my last one is another American band because like you I wanted to show what the states are putting out to try and combat this invasion yeah, yeah, um, yeah. they were digging moats for themselves so the record labels in the states were going it's costing us an awful lot of money to get these bands over from England and then they're being fucking weird um, why can't we just find local talent you know uh, yeah. Much like a, a, a promoter or a you know a venue owner in Ireland, it's like bringing over international acts is great and all, but it's very expensive. Why can't we just take a band that live here already and uh, and know how to act and uh, know how to perform and um, act correct on television and on the radio because they've grown up around what we do here and kind of strap a rocket to them and turn them into a thing. And my choice was the birds. I yeah. wanted to pick the birds. Yeah, they're, um, they're, they're quite linked, to be honest. Yeah, it's the story. Of the boards is is uh, is kind of cool, actually. So, the boards are founded in Los Angeles, nineteen sixty four. I don't think any of them are from Los Angeles. I could be wrong. I think they're from all over, all over the country. And at one stage, they were one of the most popular bands in the world for a hot minute. They were everywhere in the world. They just they were, it was. I picked torn, torn, torn because that's a, a big song of theirs. Yeah. But, um. The reason I think that they were big, in particular in the States, particularly in the States, is that I have this theory that even though America likes rock and roll and it likes blues and, you know, all, all these kind of core um, core kind of genres that, that fed off each other, I, I believe the national sound of America is not country music like we're kind of led to believe it is like if, the, if, if if when you think of america you think of fucking rah, 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 rah. You know, i always think it's more americana yeah um i i don't think that country music is it i think folk music is the american institution um i think that that's the the songs that people's parents grew up singing i think that they're the first records that people would have been exposed to and I think that that's just part of the kind of national zeitgeist of America is folk music that are super catchy, super easy to sing, have simple lyrics, simple melodies. Um, and I think the boards had kind of latched onto this idea that they wanted to meld the Beatles with Bob Dylan. And that's the way they went down. Um, yeah. They even like Mr. Tambourine Man is like one of their biggest songs, and they took this kind of weird little Bob Dylan song and turned it into a four four kind of pop, pop kind of folk song, and done yeah. bananas numbers with Mr. Tambourine Man as well. But like I said, they were one of the biggest bands in the world for a hot minute with the pop sensibilities of the kind of British invasion, alongside like the the style that America wanted, which was folk that parents wouldn't feel bad about their kids going to see this band because they were a folk band they could be kind of sold this now eventually the boards went on to do like weird experimental stuff with like uh, what what we refer to as raga rock which would be kind of psychedelic indian stuff they done a lot of that kind of stuff and yeah. they even released like a country rock album later on uh singer jim uh, jim mcginn his name is, i think he changed his name i think he was, might have been brett mcginn or something he changed his name later for some reason i don't know he's the only constant member so the rest of them but kind of came and gone but we had another member of Crosby, Stills and Nash come say, from there yeah. Um, yeah. we had members of the Flying Burrito Brothers come from the boards members of Desert Rose Band like as I said essentially a blend of like the Beatles and Bob Dylan um, they were originally called the Jet Set but their record label kind of suggested that they change their name to fit in with the British Invasion so they called themselves the Boards because that sounded English uh, even the instruments they used they started using like Rickenbacker and Ludwig drum kits, they start using the instruments, the actual brand of instruments that the Beatles were using to try and fit in. They had to essentially, even though they were an American band, they had to kind of Britify themselves, you know what I mean? They had to anglicise themselves really hard to fit in with these bands. And the fact then that they were, if they were being interviewed, they, could, they sounded familiar. Like the, the band members, when being interviewed or on television, looked and sounded familiar, and were playing a genre of music that was like incredibly familiar to everybody in the sixties because they would have grown up listening to their parents playing folk records in the house. So it, it just had this weird kind of safe version of the Beatles. Now this, this is like the start of the the primal or the like the what's the word I'm looking for? Not the prototype, but the 
prime mover original versions of like Mumford and Sons and all. Oh yeah, yeah. Where they're taking yeah. folk and making it acceptable absolutely for festivals and one hundred percent like pop festivals. Yeah. Absolutely. Rock festivals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. They they'll fit into everything. Like you've got so many of those bands that have been have kind of raised their head in the last 40, 50 years. But realistically, the boards were one of the first bands to start. Now, apparently, they wanted to go more and more down the the kind of rock route. And it's it's the, the label where, no, keep the folky element of it in there. Now, apparently, if you break down if you break down the, the original kind of lineup of the boards and what everybody in the band was playing... Um, before they joined that band, you basically have a shit hot country and western band. Like they had mandolin players playing the bass guitar and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like these guys yeah. were all known kind of honky tonk, shit kicker, country and western guys that had a passing interest in folk and a passing inter- passing interest in rock. But when this band got together, that was the idea. We're gonna do these kind of hey Mister Tambourine Man style kind of dreary folk kind of sing alongs, and we're gonna turn up the tempo a bit we're going to keep them in a 404 dancey B, and we're going to see what we can do because they, they, again they've done a bunch of covers as well at the start before yeah. they start doing their own stuff and then again like I said they start experimenting and there's some really interesting stuff when you go you listen to like the board's kind of big hits you go like oh, I know that song I know that song I know that song like, that's really cool that's really cool And um, but there's some really really weird stuff in there as well that you're like oh, I can't believe that's the same band it's like I was going to one of the bands I wanted to put on this uh, was the Moody Blues just because they were, they were doing an awful lot at this time as well. But when I think back to like Nights in White Satin and all, these, these are very, how would you even put, what type of music is that? It's, Jesus, it's it's, it's not far off kind of chamber music, like Baroque yeah, fucking pop. That's that's why I had to stick to bands that I think could be exactly the same music. Exactly. Eyeless, yeah, the, the, the way I, I thought about it is that I, want, I wanted to think of the, the, the kids that were buying Beatles records, what else were they buying as well? Yeah, you know exactly. what I mean? So um, the boards definitely fall into that. Um, definitely fall into that kind of thing. Because like, you've got, the, the boards wouldn't have been a million miles off someone like the Carpenters or something like that as well. You know, they're doing this kind of jangly, kind of happy but then every now and again there'll be like the saddest song you ever heard in your life yeah will be in there as well but the, <laughs> the, the, they, they had a, a weird crossover of stuff and I, I i do believe that a lot of these bands were just floundering in the water like they were doing one particular style and they get picked up by a record label they're pushed out on the road to try and sell as many tickets as possible as many singles as possible and let's see if these guys can go up against the beatles and if after two or three singles or one or two singles they're not doing the business they have to try and reinvent the wheel so they have to keep like, oh, yeah. why don't we try doing uh, country music? Let's try country music. And they try and bring out some... Yeah. Start bringing that kind of stuff out. And that's not going to do it either. So let's try and some, do some sad songs. Let's try and sell records to people who's broken up with their girlfriends and boyfriends. You know what I mean? That type of thing. Yeah. And because of that, you get these, the maddest mix of albums from a lot of these kind of failed contenders. You get the weirdest crossover of albums. Yeah. The first album is always... Always, poppy jangle, fucking clean, clean cut, clean Try cut. Please, everybody, exactly. Get on the telly, don't fuck it up. Exactly. Yeah. And the second albums to start messing around, and by the third or fourth album, the lads in the band start getting notions about what they want to do, and the record yeah. label are generally going to give them one or two more albums just to see if them by themselves, because this is a model that's been laid out a thousand times before where they come in doing covers and doing what they're told and then they morph like the Beatles <laughs> are probably again the prototype of the whole thing for this style and you let them do what they want and you end up having these albums that sell like a hundred million copies like so the record labels are willing to let these bands experiment a bit but if by the fourth or fifth album it's not it's not firing like it's time to go and they, yeah. they, you'll see them just kind of disappearing off like Decca or EMI or Sony or whoever, you know, whoever was doing the rounds at it the time. Mu- it must be hard when the Beatles were the trendsetters that weren't being told what to do. Exactly. In fact, like to keep up with, like if, if another band wants to go off and do their own style a little bit, that's why the Rolling Stones are to me so different. Yeah. I don't think at any stage they tried to be the Beatles at no. any stage. No, um, and a lot The, close, of the bands, closest they came was, was their like psychedelic album was yeah. um, her, her Infernal Majesty and they were chastised for it they were, and they never tried it again and they said it themselves yeah. 
They said we heard uh, Sergeant Pepper's and we're like, that's batshit mad. What if we just yeah. go mad and do whatever we want? And they do whatever I people think go, that, I think no. that was more of, more of an, an influence in terms of you can do what you want with yeah. madness yeah. than copying it. But yeah, no, no, I don't think about copying it, it, but yeah. it is, in fairness. But I think a lot of the things we're finding here is the hidden things we don't hear about like the, oh, yeah. the A&R groups are telling them if you Absolutely. don't put this out your next one isn't hit you're going off the label oh yeah 100% that was, that was a big problem that mm. was the that was the sword that hung over every band's head you know um, every band that wasn't the Beatles I think the Beatles if the Beatles had stuck around for another 20 years I don't think anybody ever would have told them that you can't do um, you can't do that because inevitably every new album that gets released pushes sales of the old album as well so you almost get a two for one deal, you know? Like every time Metallica yeah. release a new album, sales on Master of Puppets and Ride the Light and Spike. You know what I mean? So if you keep that band in your stable, keep that horse in your stable, like it's going to train the other horses on what to do. So uh, it's you'll get that one in a million shot that was someone like the Beatles and you'll get the, the other 999 fucking thousand that are attempting... Yeah. To reach that point, but like the reality is, like it was, it was a fluke that it happened in the first place. Like you know, it was yeah. absolutely a fluke that it happened in the first There's place. There's loads of bands that never made it that are better than half of this. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> just absolutely could have been, could have been. But and like, and th- there's yeah. there's a big thing about like realistically, we want to talk about the Beatles. Like there's a massive thing about the Beatles. Like the Beatles are probably bigger than they should have been. Like we're talking about the weirdest crossover of of all time like of like catching lightning in a bottle multiple times well if you think about how if that could have happened in the 90s it would have literally been Boyzone coming out with Dark Side of the Moon yeah. after a few albums exactly like it's madness exactly you know we, we just have like we've got uh, like the, even the, the uh, like kind of political position of the world played a massive factor in it you know like we're yeah. talking about what what's going on in germany and what's going on in russia and like all of this becomes become factors in it and as i said w- one in a million one in a fucking billion chance and it happens and they just keep doing it they just keep doing it and i'm not saying that's not down to talent they're obviously one of the most talented bands of all time but like sometimes things will repeat themselves because they can be forced to repeat themselves, if you get me, uh, like by the end of the Beatles' career, you're talking about like it's all right, you know what I mean? Because they didn't really give a shit anymore. So I would love to know if if they did give a shit, would the album would would the album after that be better because they start caring again, or would it just mean more? If they, the they like each other as exactly. much, yeah. like if they you weren't sick of each other, um, because yeah, it, it's a shame it went out on like. A low no. Yeah, so, it yeah. really did. Anyway, that was my last one. Who was your last one? My last one is the ones that I think came the closest. Okay. In terms of being like the Beatles and around at the exact same time. Uh, these were bigger than Herman's Hermits mm. and Manfred's Man. Mm. Manfred's Manfred Man. Every, oh, Jesus. I just, I'm having one of those days <laughs> in my day. My brain and mouth aren't linking up. <coughs> so this is the Dave Clark Five. Mm. The Dave Clark Five were a London rock and roll band formed mm. in '58, so they're, they've already got a little bit ahead of the Beatles. But they, at that time, they were only a backing band for yeah. um, a singer called Stan Saxon. So mm. it was only in '64 where they went, "We can do this ourselves," and they released that song "Glad All Over," which was so fucking big that it knocked the Beatles. I want to hold your hand off the top of the charts. So this is the start of the rivalry. The Dave Clark Five were, um, they were the second biggest group of the, of the British invasion. I think I mm. genuinely do. If you don't take the Rolling Stones into, into consideration, yeah. it depends. Some people do, some people don't. I mean, realistically, on paper, they are. So we're just going to talk about this band because they are not a bazillion miles away from the Beatles. They were the second band of the invasion to appear on the Ed Sullivan Show yeah. two, for two weeks, uh, following the Beatles. Three weeks. Uh, the month before. Mm. So they were literally only a month behind them. They were active from 59 to 70, which is a little bit longer than the Beatles, if you think about it yep. like that. And much like Herman's Hermits, they decided to not go the psychedelic route when the Beatles did. So their success started to wane by 67. Mm. But 17 records in the top 40 of the US. That's a lot. Mm. 17 top top 40. Um, they were on the Ed Sullivan show 17 times. 
in America, which is more than the Beatles. But you have to wonder did the Beatles ultimately decide that? Do you know what I mean? Mm. They stopped doing, pushing themselves out on TV shows as much. So I think that's mainly down to the fact that Dave Clark just kept doing it. Yeah. Um, like the Beatles, they wrote most of their own songs. Mm. And I have a few facts about this band that I found very interesting. So the Americans were the first to really hear of them, but in England, because they started performing their four shows at American GI military bases ah. in, in the UK. Um, they were the first British invasion band to have a full tour of America. Oh. Beatles had a little one before, a mm. small one, just to test the waters. They went full balls deep into it. This is mad. In the eight years they were around, they sold 100 million records. Wow. 15 top 20. I think I mentioned that already, yeah. Um, and unlike the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, they owned all the rights to their music mm. and their masters. Like, uh, were you saying the Hollies w- did that? No. It was the Stones owned the, Sto- the, the Stones. weird deal that they got, yeah. Triple royalties. And I owned all their own masters. Are you sure it was the Stones? Mm. I didn't know the Stones did that. Yeah, because they signed with Decca um, who dropped the, wouldn't sign the Beatles. Oh, right, right, right. Decca were like, we need them. Yeah, so between 1975 and 1983, none of their music was commercially available to buy anywhere on any format. Interesting. I don't know why that is. Mm, because I'm looking at them here on Spotify and their numbers aren't great. So no, no, they're not. That could have been because they were missing for so long, you know? Yeah, so I only have their England numbers here and it's only one number one UK. Mm. Um, Glad All Over was their debut single. Eight UK top tens. Only two weeks at number one. We're talking ELO had 56. Mm. 36 mm. weeks in the top ten. And Love Me like Love Me Do with the Beatles was their fourth big song, 62. Mm. Gal All Over was almost a year later. Yeah. So they're not... Whatever about them going to America first and all, big time, and doing more shows overall, I still think, if you look at this band's numbers, 100 million records. It's crazy. That's mostly America. Yeah. Crazy amount of And I'm, I wonder if start with the fact that if they played to hundreds and thousands of American GIs and then they went over to America, they already have a good few thousand of people who know their stuff already. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So little things like that can really, really help. Absolutely. You and especially if America hears that they play to those GIs and they're like, oh, of course, God, those, yeah. guys, those guys in America or in England were amazing, man. Of like, course. I'm actually going to go and see them. I'm going to bring fucking 10 people with me. One, I also, think of it this way, right? It's a terrible way to think about it, but think of maybe your, your, your average soldier who is in the army because they <sighs> didn't find their place in the real world. So they went to somewhere where they'd be told what to do. So yeah. maybe music isn't there, isn't a big deal. I'm not saying that's all soldiers. Yeah, obviously, obviously yeah no, but music probably was for some during these get- get-togethers. Of yeah. course it was. So then they got home and people started talking to them about music and the bands. So they're like, oh, I, I, oh, we had this band uh, called, called the uh, Dave Clark band and, and, and uh, they're real good. And he goes out and buys them. You know what I mean? Or his mates like, are they good? Yeah, yeah, you have to get them. They're real cool. And uh, like you said, all of a sudden you've got fucking tens of thousands of a base a fan base already there because that's probably the closest thing to like new music they've heard since they signed up you know yes. it's a, a great little marketing campaign you know yeah it's mad and they wouldn't even go to America to do it like most yeah. people do um, honestly I can't like it's really hard for us to find the numbers now or to, to really quantify how popular Dave Clark 5 and some of these bands were yeah. up against the Beatles but honestly if you're on the Ed Sullivan show 17 times yeah that's a big deal. That's, like, that's where everyone in America found out about everything. Yeah, and if you sold 100 million records <sighs> and you had nearly 15, 16, whatever it was, top 20 US singles, yeah. they were rivaling the Beatles, but not really in England. Yeah. So, yeah. That's my last one. Do, do, do you know Definitely. what? We have to give an honorable mention. Actually, first of all, we should mention the Beatles numbers. Yes. 17 number ones. Yep. 28. Top 10s. Yep. This isn't just in the UK. 38 top 40s, 56 top 75s. Let's move over that. Uh, all in all, weeks in the top 10, 188. Yeah, bananas. Jesus Christ. Bananas. But well, we all, I want to give a shout out to the other bands part of the mm. invasion who didn't make it on. That's the Zombies. Yeah. The Who, Jerry and the Pacemakers, the Searchers, and the Animals. Yeah. But nobody really beats the Beatles. Maybe 
Do you know what? It, if you were trying to figure out who beats the Beatles after the Beatles, you'd have to put David Bowie and Queen together. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And Absolutely. then you got it. Or Michael Jackson on his own. Yeah. Like, we thought, the, the, one of the reasons, like, maybe the, the zombies and the animals didn't show up was just because they showed up in podcasts in the last month. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, we... we We've only got 10 bands to pick. Exactly. Like, realistically. And, and I could, could have picked one of them over ELO because ELO came afterwards, but I just wanted to get the mantle in there as well. The mantle exactly. is important as well in terms of rivalry because, mm. I don't know, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, anyway, that's it. That was a long one, but a fun one. That was nearly two hours. Jesus. Uh, yeah, the, that in a while. The, the good to two hours, yeah, because we've been keeping it. Uh, almost every podcast we've done in the last two months has been one hour and 16 minutes long for some reason. That's without me ed- editing them. Like they're just torn out to be an hour and sixteen minutes. That's it's mad. real weird. Um yeah, that's, <laughs> that that was a, a longer one, but there's more more to chew on there. Uh if you have uh dissenting we'll, we'll, opinion, we'll that, let us we'll know. Put that, that playlist up as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Because uh Absolutely. it's really interesting. If you're a fan of the Beatles, you'll enjoy that as well. Yeah, one hundred percent. Um yeah, if you have a dissenting opinion, if you think there's another band we should have included, let us know. Uh if not, fuck off. Uh, we'll be back on Saturday with a live show, which is going to be our one-year anniversary show. Yes, yes. Mm, yes. Fuck yeah. Let's get our digital dick soaked helmet. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's fucking do it. A one whole year of live shows. Um, pretty much every Saturday night, we've had some form of live entertainment for you for a year. That's bananas. That's crazy. If we can help just one person, Gareth. Exactly. You can make same, one life's same. child different. Saying it makes it worth it, we still would like to help you, or for you to help us pay the bills though. Absolutely, and you can do that by going to patreon.com forward slash lost our podcast, that's our subscription service. It's five euros or five dollars a month, you get access to loads of exclusive content and podcasts and videos and all sorts of show you. Uh, that's, uh, loads of stuff goes up there, and is up there, and you have access to all of it, like two years worth of stuff that we, we've been throwing up, and we, we have, we're trying to find some time to do some more exclusive Patreon stuff that we have planned, and That's have done a little tough. bit of work on, it's hard at the moment, uh, it's just, it's, even though I'm out of work, and you're in work, you're working weird hours, and I've got I a lot of weird hours. shit, yeah. Yeah. I've, had, I've a lot of weird shit going on at the moment, with, with the job that I'm working on kind of constantly, um, yeah. but if subscription based services aren't your bag, go to ko-fi.com forward slash lost art podcast, just tip us, all of our links are up on lost art podcast, Com. Let's put it that way. And the links are in the text of wherever you clicked on listen to this. They're in the text. I need to click them and give them a little help. Boy is a point. Boy is a point. If you saw us, saw us in the pub, we get emails and messages all the time of people saying like, you know, you've really helped during the lockdown and uh, it's nice to have, to know there's a show coming out every Monday and then we get to sit down Saturday night and crack out in the can and listen to tunes and talk shit with us. That's great. And uh, everybody who does support us on Patreon, thumbs up to you. Super, everybody who tips us on co fight, that's great. If you if you haven't done it, do us a favour. Throw us a few quid, pay us for the work, um, because the bills come in hot and heavy. And there will there will come a time where we can't afford to pay the bills and there will be we won't be able to do this anymore. Because this is a well not necessarily a business venture, has to pay for itself, folks. Because uh, I'm on the dowel right now. So it has to pay for itself, it's that simple. Um and Helma has a talking cat to feed. So <laughs> Um, two cats, one of them doesn't talk as much. One of them, one of them's just a normal cat, just doing cat stuff, and one of them's walking around talking. And uh, yeah, and one of one of my pigeons laid two eggs last week. So uh, life is complicated, and one of the dogs has a phantom preg- pregnancy, and it's, everyone's just a bit strange at the moment. So uh, do that for us. We will talk to you on Monday, next Monday with yes. a fresh podcast, and we'll see you on Saturday for a one year anniversary radio show, Lost Art Live, and it's going to be Whopper. Uh, Dude, th- join in, there'll be something to do before yes. we all go back to the pubs. Exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, whatever you are. See you next week. Look.